My name is Guy Caruso. I'm part of uh, Sarah Lattice Law's energy team here at CSIS. And we're really pleased that you could all make it today because you're in for a, a real treat to listen to one of the world's leading uh, oil market analysts and uh, experts on not only uh, oil, but the, also the financial side, because uh, Antoine has, in addition to being the head of the uh, Energy Markets Division within uh, IEA, he's had ex extensive experience both on the financial community side in, uh, in New York and uh, taught at Columbia and worked for a while at the Energy Intelligence Group, at, uh, which is uh, responsible for publishing things like Petroleum Intelligence Weekly. So Antoine's had enormous experience his second time at the IEA, and I know for a fact that's the second time's better than the first was for me. And uh, so uh, he's only missing one corner of the uh, triangle for a trifecta because he left uh, to go to the IEA from EIA. And so now he's been at the IEA. But uh, I don't think you'll be going to CIA, will you? Because that's. Uh, because if you do, then you join a, a club, and then I'll give you the password and the uh, secret handshake. That, uh, that, that Antoine is, uh, comes to us at a really critical time in the oil market, as we uh, some of us heard from Adam Siminski yesterday about the complications of trying to predict where the oil market's going to be in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Well, I think it's even tougher to uh, the task you have now, Antoine, to think about the five-year outlook because there's so many uh, uncertainties when it comes to the uh, oil price uh, path over the next several years and what that means for things like unconventional oil and uh, certainly gas as well. Uh, what it means for uh, the inventory situation, which because of the oversupply we've witnessed in the last 18 months is now well over, uh, we're well overstocked as, a, as an oil market, world oil market right now. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing your thoughts on, on those things and we always enjoy uh, your coming to spend some time with us, Antoine, and appreciate your, your being here. Antoine. Be here this morning and share our views, which are still fairly fresh, so haven't been proven completely wrong yet. Uh, the report only came out uh, two weeks ago. And uh, thanks very much for the kind words. I always feel uh, having experience plays both ways in, uh, in oil. Sometimes it can be a disadvantage because you can be a victim of uh, accepted wisdom or um, patterns that you take for granted, but uh, sometimes it prevents you from being alert to changes in the market. And there's many changes uh, in the market these days. And uh, so the report uh, that I'm presenting is, is an annual effort uh, to look at the next five to six years. And the last one, uh, the last time I was here actually was not too long ago, I think in, in uh, June or July, when the previous uh, edition, the 2014 report came out. And it came out just about a week after uh, ISIS took over Mosul in Iraq, and then uh, just a couple of weeks later, the price started declining, so we thought that we should probably not wait until the next June to, to publish the 2015 edition of the medium-term report, and we so decided to do it earlier, uh, which was challenging in terms of uh, the workload and uh, the stress on the very small team that uh, we do, because we also do the all-market report on a monthly basis. But this is our kind of best effort to try to comprehensively understand the impact, not so much of ISIS, because that's kind of uh, moved, not to the background, but it, 
we see to compare to the impact of the low price. And our main effort here has been to try to understand what the resetting of price expectations and the drop in prices meant for uh, supply, for demand, for OPEC supply, for non-OPEC supply, um, and also for trade, refining every aspect of the supply chain um, and, and product supply. So <clears throat> what we felt is, um, well, first of all, we, we you know, maybe a couple of words about our price and uh, GDP assumptions in the report. There's two, two inputs that go into our modeling effort. Uh, the, uh, the, the price, uh, so it's a 60% drop since June, and then a 10% or so rebound more recently. We think there's more room to, to go down. We don't think the, the downturn has run its course yet. Um, but we don't have a mandate to forecast prices. That they, actually, we have a mandate not to forecast prices in a way. We've taken some liberties with the mandate. We've been a little bit more explicit about our price expectations or price uh, where we thought the price would, would go in the last few months. And I think the, our audience has responded very favorably to that, to that trend. I think it's helpful to try to be more explicit about uh, price direction. Um, this is, in a way, the best way to express our views about the market and what many of our readers care about the most. Uh, but we... Uh, for, for the medium term, we, we can't really forecast our price, so we have to use price assumptions, and we use the, the futures curve, uh, or price derived from the futures curve. We adjust, we adjust the brand curve for the difference between the brand price and the average important price of crude for IEA members. Um, so it's a, it's a lower price. The, the curve suggests a rebound. You know, it's a contango curve, uh, but the, the, the long term or the medium term expectations are still considerably, considerably lower than what we had uh, used as an assumption for our previous report. Um, and in terms of, uh, of, of GDP, we use the IMF forecast. The IMF forecast has been uh, revised repeatedly over the last few years. Uh, the expectation of a recovery in the economy has been kind of uh, toned down and pushed back a little bit uh, over the years since, uh, since the financial crisis. And it's quite remarkable to us that since the price started falling, uh, and typically uh, a lower price is, is considered a boon to the economy, uh, uh, something you know, that is stimulus for social, for domestic uh, household spending and business investment and so on. But counterintuitively, since the, the beginning of the price collapse, the, the IMF has revised its numbers twice and both times to the downside. So since uh, July, when the, the, the WIO came out, the World Economic Outlook came out, uh, the, the expectation for 2015 growth has been revised from 4% to 3.5%. So it's quite um, illustrative of how different this price downturn is, in our view, uh, the, the demand response is going to be very different, is very different. The supply response looks very different. Uh, <clears throat> just in a nutshell, uh, let me jump to the conclusion, then I go back to, to what's behind it. But we are forecasting, essentially, the market to, to rebalance, to start rebalancing sometime around mid-year this year. There's been many announcements of uh, investment cuts, spending cuts by companies. Uh, there's some sign of a demand response, but it's fairly tentative, difficult to, to uh, interpret. Uh, we, we, we don't think there's going to be much of a, a demand response. We think there's going to be a very strong, we, we think supply has become much more price responsive, demand much less price responsive than in the past. But the, the, the net result is that we think the market, we start rebalancing around July, mid, mid year, and then gradually uh, demand, even though it will be weaker than historic trends, will be stronger than it's been last year will increase and will be stronger than what we expect supply capacity growth will be. So that means that the, the strategy of OPEC to let the market rebalance to, to regain market share, in our view, will work, not spectacularly. Uh, OPEC will not regain the kind of market share it had uh, in the last few years, but it will regain more market share than it has today. And market share will creep up, at least of supply, in terms of its share of global capacity. Uh, we don't think that it's going to change much. We think it'll be pretty much flat. Uh, but we see uh, a little bit of an increase in the nominal OPEX per capacity over the next few years. We call this market business as unusual because we think uh, this is a very unique uh, set of circumstances. This is not the, the, this price collapse since June was not completely unexpected. It's not unprecedented, but it's very different, very unique in many ways. It's not unexpected uh, because our previous medium term reports for three years now, had been forecasting a significant increase in the level of uh, OPEC spare capacity, which is a way to say there's going to be oversupply if OPEC doesn't rein in the capacity. And that's 
essentially what's happened, uh, OPEC has maintained production above the, the call, and we've seen a significant increase in, in inventories in the last few months, which has put downward pressure on prices. We couldn't forecast the exact timing of the price drop, nor the speed of it, but uh, it's certainly consistent with our expectations of the, of the last few months, of the last few years, really. Uh, and it's not unprecedented because the market has experienced dramatic swings uh, of a similar magnitude about every 10 years in the last 30 years. There was a very steep drop in 1985, another one in 1997, 98, at the time of the Asian financial crisis, and then again in 2008 with the, the global financial crisis. So it's not the first time, uh, but it's very different this time uh, for a couple of uh, reasons, a few reasons, having to do both with the supply side and the demand side. The biggest, the most obvious changes are on the supply side, uh, because this is the first time that we have a downturn in prices and light title is a major share of the, of the supply mix. Uh, light title you know, was not around in a big way in 2008, uh, the last time the price collapsed. Now it's a, it's a significant share of US production, it's a big share of global production, but it's, a, it's an even bigger share of expected supply growth and of the supply growth in the last few years. And light title is different because it has shorter lead times, shorter payback times, very steep depletion rates, so it requires more constant, more gradual investment than conventional production, and presumably it's a lot more responsive to a price drop. At least that's our assumption. Uh, obviously, this hasn't been fully tested, and we're going to watch in the next few months to see how it plays out. Uh, we also think that light title is going to be more responsive in a price rebound, uh, because for the same reason, investors will be faster to uh, respond to, to uh, um, feed in uh, spending and respond to the price rebound, which we think will happen in the next few years. And we think that the, the, uh, the um, payoff of those investments would be much faster than is typically the case for conventional production. So that, in our view, will put a bit of a ceiling on the price recovery, perhaps a floor on the price drop. We still think there's room for, for price declines in the next few months, but the, uh, the speed of the, the light title response, in our view, will put a bit of a floor. So this will minimize the scope for uh, overshoot and undershoot in the price reaction, and this will make, in our view, the, this recovery quite different from previous ones, at least for the next few years. Now, there's questions about what that means for further out in the next decade. But for the next few years, we, we see the market as likely to be a little bit more smooth and balanced than in previous, previous price swings. But there's also very new developments on the demand side, and we think that uh, demand will be much less responsive to prices than it has been the case in, in the past. Uh, and that for a number of, of reasons, um, both cyclical and structural. For the OECD economies, uh, the recovery, uh, the economic recovery has been very weak. Uh, the, the, the effects of the financial crisis continue to linger, particularly in Europe, in, uh, in Asia, in Japan. Uh, but even in the US, the recovery is stronger than in the rest of the OECD, but not all that strong historically. Um, and what's very new this time is that there's deflation concerns. Uh, this had never happened before. Uh, the, the world hasn't had much experience with deflation since World War II. And in truth, we don't really know uh, what low prices do in a deflation environment. The only experience we have is Japan in the late 90s and last decade uh, for a sustained period of time. And there we've seen, at the same time, significant declines in yen de denominated oil prices and significant declines in domestic oil consumption. Uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that there's, there's a direct correlation between the two. There's many other factors at play there. Uh, it's difficult to segregate those, those, uh, those, those factors and really isolate the impact of uh, low price on, on deflation and, and Japanese economic growth during those years. Uh, but there's concerns that low price will feed into deflation expectations and will effectively, instead of stimulating the economy, will actually hold back investment uh, for, for businesses and, and even for, for households. Um, other uh, factors, the, the changes in, in currency uh, exchange rates, uh, that mutes the impact of the price drop for many consumer countries where the currency has depreciated against the dollar and that has offset the decline in, in dollar-denominated prices. Many importing economies are taking advantage of the price drop to desubsidize uh, oil, to, to cut back, uh, dismantle their very costly and uh, ineffective subsidy programs. Again, that kind of shields consumers from the full effect of the price drops. And, uh, and then uh, there's a shift in gears in the Chinese economy, uh, a move to a low oil intensity um, nature of the global economy, uh, fuel switching on the scale that uh, just a couple of years ago probably was, uh, would have seemed unfathomable, uh, not just renewables in the, in the power generation sector, but also gas in transport. 
uh, which just two years ago would have seen a long-term prospect, but now is becoming a, a reality on a significant scale. So and, and environmental, environmental policies. So all these factors, in our view, will mute the, uh, the response of, uh, of, of demand to the lower price. So unusual circumstances, uh, exceptional circumstances in a way which, in our view, will lead to an exceptional type of response. And the market will rebalance, but it will not go back to where it was before. Uh, it will not go back to square one. Uh, it will be a transform market, a, a significantly different market with a new role for OPEC, a new role for U.S. production as a kind of swing producer for the time being, and uh, a very different type of demand growth than we've seen in the past. So on the supply side, I, I think I have too many slides, so uh, I hope it's okay if I can go slide uh, fairly fast on some of them. Uh, but we, we, th we think that um, uh, global capacity will continue to grow, um, not insignificantly, but quite more, uh, rather more slowly than has been the case recently. So last year um, was an exceptionally strong year for supply. Uh, the average for 2018, 2014 was about 1.4 million barrels per day uh, of global capacity uh, growth. So we think in, uh, in the next few years to 2020, in the next six years, the average is going to be closer to 900 or a little bit below 8, 860 in our view. And that's going to be um, kind of uh, um, split between OPEC and non-OPEC proportionately to their share of, of supply, uh, about two-thirds for, for non-OPEC, one-third for OPEC. And in, uh, in non-OPEC, what's, what's remarkable uh, in our view is that um, where the growth uh, we think is going to be about 3.4 million bars per day for the period by 2020, so reaching 60 by million bars per day by 2020. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a much lower growth than the record we've seen of 1.9 in 2014. But what's remarkable is that the, the geographic makeup of this growth is pretty much the same as before. The, the price drop, in our view, doesn't really change the story in terms of where the growth is coming from. Uh, it's still really uh, led by the OECD Americas, by the US, by Canada, uh, color-coded uh, marine blue, I think, on this graph. So we, we see slow growth from Canada and the U.S., uh, but still very strong growth, and, and that's still where we see most of the increment coming from. Uh, we have cut back the, the forecast for U.S. supply for the front end of the forecast period, but we have increased it for the back end of this forecast period. And what we see is that by the, by the end of the decade, um, light title, uh, U.S. light title, will, will actually come out stronger in terms of its share of global supply. There's been many comments in the press that, the, that OPEC's move to let the market rebalance was targeting light title as a high cost production uh, that it wanted to, to uh, really uh, uh, push back. In fact, we, we think that light title will respond initially, but then uh, investment will recover, and at the end of the period, is going to account for a larger share of the global supply mix than, uh, than we thought before the price drop. Uh, it might also be a more efficient sector if there's some consolidation in the light title industry. Uh, there might be some uh, economies of scale, some efficiency improvements achieved by some, some restructuring of the sector. Uh, so the, the three main sources continue to be U.S. and uh, the Brazil, uh, U.S. by far margin. It's not shown because it's too big here to fit on this, on this chart. Uh, then Brazil and, and Canada, and then the, the, the rest is very small, uh, very small components. Russia, in our view, is, is going to contract. So Russia is coming out, uh, standing out as the, the country most adversely affected by this uh, price reset, partly because there the, the um, price uh, drop uh, compounds the impact of sanctions. And the two together, with also the depreciation of the ruble at the margin, uh, really, it's kind of a perfect storm, really affecting, hitting Russia pretty hard, in our view. Um, and now, uh, you know, if we try to assess what the price drop has done to our expectations of supply growth, uh, we think that it's probably a cut in, in, in supply growth expectations of about 2.8 million barrels per day. Uh, and most of that is really coming from Russia. Uh, where we think that uh, we thought before that Russia would, uh, Russian production would increase over the next few years. Now, we now think it's going to contract significantly. So it's, uh, it's a drop versus previous expectations of more than 700,000 barrels per day for Russia. Next is, is the U.S., still the largest uh, source of incremental production, but, but our expectations have been reduced markedly. Uh, Canada as well. And then uh, the, the other cats come from uh, non-OPEC Africa, from the North Sea, particularly Norway, 
Colombia, uh, significant, and then uh, small, 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 small uh, pieces from um, uh, non-OPEC Middle East, mostly because of uh, unrest and uh, violence in Syria, Yemen, uh, a little bit from China, a little bit from the, from the Caspian. And uh, the supply, the, the, the supply impact of, uh, of the low price is really very different depending on the countries. So it's not, it doesn't play, it doesn't work out the same for every producer country. There's a very significant differences. Uh, again, in the US, it's a, it's a strong response initially, but then at the back end, we think that there will be uh, a reversal. Uh, for Russia, it's a more sustained, uh, consistently adverse effect all across the, the forecast period. And now, at the same time, one thing we um, came out of our um, forecasting and analysis is that uh, there's kind of a double-edged impact of, of low price on production. For the most part, it's uh, negative. It's, uh, it means low investment. It means uh, our projects are less profitable. There's less money to invest, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to floating around, to uh, put into uh, um, uh, projects. So companies are going to be cutting uh, expenditures be much more selective, uh, prioritize investment much more uh, rigorously, and that's going to be playing adversely on, on supply growth. That's why we have a reduction of 2.8 compared to our previous expectations. But at the same time, we, have also, we also recognize that low prices can be a stimulus to supply because for some countries, it can't really uh, be an incentive to make up in, in volume what's lost in, in price. Uh, and we see that in particular in Iraq, where we, there's already evidence of it. Uh, Iraq uh, has been doing amazingly well uh, ever since things got worse there. Uh, with the uh, ISIS campaign in June and uh, the collapse in prices, since then, uh, the country really has defined expectations. And remarkably, KRG and Baghdad, which for years uh, were locked in a seemingly intractable dispute uh, over the uh, split of export revenues and that had been holding back production from the north, uh, the, the two sides have come to an agreement and production has been able to, to, to rise, exports have, have risen and have really defined expectations. So in our view, there's some countries where uh, the governments are highly dependent on a very high price to meet budget uh, needs and to fund social spending. Uh, some of those countries have high buffers like uh, Saudi Arabia, other GCC countries. There they will be able to weather the storm, but where there's no buffer, there's an extreme pressure to get uh, production up. And uh, that could create some upward surprise on supply, uh, a need to uh, make the, the, the country more hospitable to investment. Iraq certainly is the case, uh, but the same could happen uh, in Venezuela. Uh, there, uh, we see some signs that the country is becoming desperately aware of the need to make the, 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 the market more hospitable to investment, to clean up the uh, investment climate, to become more transparent, more predictable. And uh, we're, we're negative on Venezuela, but recognize that uh, there's an upside risk to supply there as well. So North America really uh, is, is where most of the non-OPEC supply growth comes from. Uh, U.S. production, we, we think, will near 14 million barrels per day. Can, Canada, Canadian production will almost reach 5 million barrels per day by the end of the decade, the beginning of the next decade. Uh, it's going to be mostly unconventional production, both in the U.S. and, and Canada by the time, the, uh, by the beginning of the decade. Um, in, uh, in the U.S., it's, it's a complicated exercise. Uh, so we rely a lot on third-party research, which is a, maybe a problem for us because we, we don't really have the, the manpower or the resources to put in all the resources that really the, the new developments require. Uh, but uh, what strikes us is that it's a, it's a complex, it's a mixed and very nuanced situation where you have lower prices, but you also have, and you have uh, debt issues, liquidity issues. But at the same time, there's very significant drops in cost, production costs, very significant improvements in productivity, wealth productivity, efficiency of supply. But at the same time, uh, we think that by, the, uh, by 2020, the uh, production we have, st we have started to exhaust the, the production from the sweet spots. There's going to be decline rates. The sweet spots are uh, the first ones that are targeted by invest investors, investment, and those will eventually deplete. So we think that despite improvements in productivity and efficiency, the break-even uh, cost in, uh, in the U.S. would actually rise over the forecast period. Uh, Brazil, 
it's, uh, that's, that's, in our view, going to be the second largest sources, source of incremental supply. We, we saw very good performance in the second half of 2014, even as the news from the country about Petrobras and so on uh, got more concerning. Uh, so those, those problems, legal issues, uh, investigations, uh, downgrading of the Petrobras debt, those are all problems that can hold back investment and, and hold back uh, supply growth. But at the same time, we see a payoff from investment that's, uh, that's already sunk, and that's starting to make a big impact on supply. So uh, there's different stories. You know, we see a worse outlook for Campos Basin, but the Santos Basin, we see TC growth there. And on balance, we, still, we see significant growth from the country, uh, a lot less in 2017 than we had expected, but over the forecast period, it's still a very significant uh, source of, of growth. Russia, uh, there, that's the, where the, most, the biggest hit is, is, uh, is being felt. And again, it's a combination of the, the sanctions and the, and the low price. The sanctions in and of themselves, when they came out in April, uh, seem to us unlikely to affect supply in a big way, at least until 2020, maybe a little bit more further out. Um, and the, the oil price itself might not have had as big an impact as it has, but the combination of the low price and the sanctions mean that the, the country cannot easily go to capital markets to make up for the shortfall in revenue. And that, uh, at the same time, has trouble accessing technology uh, and, uh, and uh, bringing uh, companies in. So the combination of those factors really uh, are going to hit both in the short term and in the longer term. Uh, we think the Greenfield uh, startups will be delayed significantly. Uh, the, the government will be affected more than the companies because of the way all is taxed and uh, the tax regime, uh, uh, um, the tax burden is much higher at higher price than at lower price. So the main challenge will be for the government, but on balance we see a much lower performance and actually contraction in the, in the next few years. And in the North Sea, uh, we also have been uh, cutting back our expectation of supply growth. We had expected a little bit of a, of a growth uh, from uh, the North Sea uh, before the price drop. We now think it's going to be about flat or slightly down, uh, about flat in the UK, down in, in Norway. Uh, for Mexico, uh, the need to reform is just as urgent uh, in a low-price environment as in a high-price environment, if not even more so. Uh, but there's a problem uh, with implementing the, the reforms, so we think there's going to be some slowdowns. Uh, the uh, programs for unconventional uh, players uh, has been uh, held back indefinitely, uh, partly probably because the, the players that uh, Mexico would like to attract there are the ones that are most uh, closely watching their budget uh, plans. Uh, but there's also issues with assessing the value of the players on offer. Uh, so some delays, but the, the, the rationale for opening the country and the attraction of being in the country for companies remain just the same. So we see growth there, but further out at the back end of the forecast period and less than uh, we previously expected before the price drop. And in the Caspian, uh, it's a story of declines in Azerbaijan and, and uh, delayed growth in Kazakhstan. So it's a bit of a, an offset. Uh, Kazakhstan, we basically because of, not really because of the price drop, but just because of the problem at Kashagan. And the, the, so we, we think that the growth will be delayed by a couple of years, uh, but will eventually kick in. In Azerbaijan, we, we're seeing declines. Uh, and China, we think, is going to be about flat, uh, with uh, some, some gains from uh, enhanced oil recovery, uh, but uh, not, not much growth, kind of a flat performance. Biofuels, it's a small growth. Uh, the, bio, the, the main market for biofuels are kind of mature saturated, the US, uh, Brazil, and, and uh, Europe. We don't see much growth in, in demand there. Uh, but in other countries, demand is really driven by policy mandates, not by economics. And uh, a lot of countries, especially in Southeast Asia, have been increasing their biofuel mandates. And that's, uh, that, in our view, is going to support some production growth in the next few years. So nothing uh, dramatic, but a continued creep up in, in biofuel capacity despite the price drop and despite the fact that, on paper, biofuels look less attractive today in a low oil price environment than they did before. Now, uh, looking at OPEC, uh, we see significant impacts on OPEC uh, capacity prospects as well from the lower price, and our expectations have been significantly reduced. We only see about 200,000 barrels per day of, of capacity growth over the next six years, compared to uh, 350,000 barrels per day before the, 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 uh, the price collapse. We have revisited some, some of our assumptions, some of our analysis or forecasts 
for reasons not entirely related to, to the price drop. But on balance, a lot of this reduction is, is price driven. And, but what's remarkable there is that it's almost entirely driven by, by Iraq. In terms of capacity, as I mentioned before, we, we think that uh, OPEC will regain some market share in supply, uh, not much in capacity in the next uh, six years. So it will, it will partially regain uh, market share. But really, uh, the, the remarkable trait is the, the very large share of Iraq in this, uh, in this growth. Uh, that's where 90% of the growth from OPEC capacity is likely to come. And given the problems uh, facing Iraq, uh, it's, it's a highly risked uh, forecast. There's a, a very high risk that the performance will be less than this base case uh, forecast. There's also some risk that it will be higher. Uh, Iraq surprise in, in December reaching 4 million barrels per day for okay, our production at one point. We think the average for the month was more like 3.75. It's come down a little bit since then. But there's obviously tremendous resources, tremendous potential. And if the country makes further progress in getting over above ground issues, red tape, uh, inefficiencies, uh, infrastructure constraints, there's potential for supply to be even higher than, than uh, what we, we forecast. But the, the, the security risk is huge. Uh, the ISIS uh, presence in, in Northwest is, is a, a daunting problem. It hasn't held back supply so much so far. Uh, but it's still a risk. It's still going to deter investment to prevent the expatriation of, of uh, oil workers in the in the region. And there's a risk of violence spreading to other parts of Iraq, including the, the, the south, uh, where most of the production and most of the growth is coming from. Uh, the other place where we see growth is, is uh, the UAE. That's, in our view, going to be the second largest source of incremental uh, OPEC capacity with uh, Upper Zakum due to add uh, a quarter of a million barrels by 2017. Uh, ATCO, the giant, uh, the, the, the ATCO concessions takes there are being are starting to be awarded. Uh, Total was given one. Uh, other companies are uh, in the running, so uh, we see some uh, some growth there, uh, mostly from offshore. Uh, Nigeria, there we have reduced our expectations, uh, and uh, uh, we see delays in the deep water projects. We see continued problems uh, having to do with uncertainty and the unlike the the, the uh, uh, problems uh, passing the petroleum, petroleum industry bill. Uh, so uh, there, uh, and, and on top of that, there's also security issues with Boko Haram in the north, uh, not affecting the south directly so far, but the concern uh, which uh, earlier this year led to some uh, companies, like uh, some, some of the companies in Nigeria to remove personnel from Nigeria for the first time in the, the, the entire you know, multi-decade uh, history in the country. So we, we, we think that uh, Nigeria actually will see some contraction in, uh, in capacity and in production over the next six years. Uh, Libya is, is a wild card. Uh, production came back after 2011 much faster than anybody expected. And then it fell back again, came back again in June when the two uh, fighting sides uh, agreed on, on the splitting export revenues. Now things are taking a turn for the worse. Uh, the the uh, front line has moved to the oil facilities themselves. There's been uh, oil facilities directly affected by uh, military hits. And there's been initially, I think, accidental perhaps targeting of oil facilities, but then more recently uh, deliberate intentional targeting of, of oil facilities for the first time since the beginning of the uh, civil war in 2011. So things are, are looking worse there. We are uh, assuming there that it will settle down and that there will be a partial recovery in production, a mod modest one, uh, but there's room here for, for uh, there's some downside risk to that forecast. And uh, <coughs> now what's not, what's not factored into our forecast is the possibility of a return in Iranian production. Uh, one of our assumptions is, uh, well, typically we assume that policies, existing policies remain in place unless changes in policy uh, have been already uh, announced and, and, and uh, programmed. In the case of Iran, we assume in the forecast that the sanctions remain in place. Uh, of course, this is uh, an assumption that could be uh, tested uh, and could be tested very soon. The move by OPEC and Saudi Arabia to let the market rebalance uh, has often been described as a, as a fight for market share as opposed to prices. Uh, so we think that the, the fight for market share might only be at the, at the early stage. And if Iran came back, uh, we think that uh, it could uh, really uh, return to the market rapidly. And we have revised our assessment last year. We thought 
that the shutdown of uh, fields because of the sanctions had led to some long-term damage to capacity. And we've taken a very hard look at this uh, uh, with uh, input and insights from uh, people very close to the situation on the ground, both from Iran and from outside. And we actually think now that Iran has, been, has deployed considerable ingenuity uh, getting around the sanctions to maintain capacity at the fields, to get them in fairly tipped up shape. And that uh, if, if sanctions on Iran exports were to be lifted, we think Iran could pretty much come back to the market on a dime. And in our view, the biggest constraint to an increase in Iranian supply will not be uh, constraints or, or, or damage to Iranian long-term capacity, it will be the market's capacity to absorb this new production. Uh, so we, we could see, uh, in the event of a, of a lifting of sanctions, a new uh, leg in the, in the downturn in prices uh, and a renewed downward uh, pressure on the market and, and uh, a new uh, sequence of rebalancing uh, around, the, around the, uh, the producing world. So a few words on demand. Uh, again, it's a very mixed response depending on the countries. Uh, the impact is not the same everywhere. Obviously, the most adversely affected countries are going to be the producing countries. And uh, not surprisingly, uh, Russia and the FSU is where we see uh, uh, most of the hit on, on demand growth. Uh, we think Russia is going to be, uh, and we take our cue in part from IMF forecast that Russia will face a, a recession this year, uh, maybe next year. Uh, and it will affect not just Russia itself, but also the many countries uh, in the region that depend on Russia for their own economic growth through uh, uh, external trade, through uh, direct investment, through remittances. Uh, so it's going to affect Caspian uh, uh, regions, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, so we, we, we feel there's going to be a significant downturn uh, in, um, in demand in the FSU. In the Middle East, um, as I mentioned, the, even though oil revenues are going to be considerably uh, down uh, compared to uh, where they were before the price drop, uh, within the Middle East we see diverse responses uh, for countries like Saudi Arabia or Kuwait or GCC countries in general. Uh, there, there's high reserves, high, high cash reserves, high buffers that will allow the countries to maintain social spending, to maintain infrastructure spending, if not even to increase it as a way to uh, mute uh, um, um, social pressures. Uh, but in other countries, it's not going to be the case. And uh, here, most of the downturn we see coming from Iran. And again, that's based on the idea that the sanctions remain in place. But we, we, we think that with the downturn in prices, the Iranian economy will struggle, and this will affect Iranian consumption. Uh, other places where uh, demand is hit in the Middle East are the countries where war or violence, particularly Syria, Yemen, um, and, um, and Iraq. Uh, in, uh, in Africa, some downturn, again, for the same reason, because all, importing, all exporting countries will see less revenues. Um, Latin America, same story with Venezuela. In India uh, and the US, those back the trend. We see the biggest uh, uh, positive impact from low prices in the US uh, because it's a dollar economy, so the dollar denominated uh, oil price drop uh, is directly felt by consumers. Oil taxes, uh, retail taxes are very low. Uh, again, uh, letting consumers enjoy the, pretty much the full benefits of the price drop. Uh, and the economy is showing some signs of a revival or that the recovery is picking up momentum. Uh, and India, we, we think that uh, there's room for growth as well. There's more uh, confidence in the economy with the Modi government. Uh, and the, last year, there was some downward uh, pressure on demand because of the desubsidization of diesel. Uh, but that's now run its course. Uh, the, 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 the diesel subsidies have been uh, eliminated, and we think that there's room for a little bit of a rebound there. So this is a graph that illustrates the differences in, in oil prices, depending on which currencies they're, they're expressed in. And if you look at Russia, it's basically been uh, a flat, uh, a flat uh, change. Prices in Russia have not really changed. Uh, expressed in rubles, in contrast with uh, other countries in, in Europe. We've seen declines uh, in, in uh, China as well, but not as, uh, uh, in the case of Europe, not as steep as in, uh, as, in, uh, as in the US. So on balance, we, we think it's going to be growth of 1.2% uh, per annum over the next uh, six years, which is a lot more than this year, uh, 2014, last year. Uh, but uh, is less than the trend, the historic trend, prior to the recession. 
uh, when uh, between 2001 and 2007, the growth trend was more like 1.9%. Uh, but despite this, this uh, uh, shift to a slower pace of growth compared to historic trends, we think that demand will increase faster than, than global capacity. And by the end of the forecast, we are projecting that demand will have increased by 1 million barrels a day more than capacity. So that means that the, the market will tighten, uh, not dramatically, but will tighten at the margin, and, and that will support the recovery in prices. The, 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 um, the story there, uh, in terms of the geographic distribution of growth, is not changed uh, by the price drop. It's still the same story, which is a move eastward of, of demand. Uh, growth in Asia-Pacific, that's where the biggest increment is coming from. Uh, we think that Asian growth in demand will slow compared to the previous six years and the six years before that, uh, but it will remain very, very significant compared to uh, other regions. So that's uh, really where the, remains the, the biggest engine of growth, uh, if you'd like. Growth in the Middle East will be less than we had expected, uh, given the slowdown that we expect in, in Iran. Uh, FSU is going to be about flat. Uh, so it, it's still going to be a, a rebalancing of demand, a move eastward of the market, east of Suez, especially east to Asia. And the, the uh, OECD share has already uh, dropped below 50% uh, as of last year, in our view, and that will continue. The non-OECD regions will continue to, to uh, um, grow, uh, even as OECD demand will contract on, on balance, and the wedge between the two will, will increase, uh, perhaps a little bit less fast than we had expected uh, just six months ago, but we still think that uh, the non-OECD uh, group of uh, countries will account for a significantly larger share of supply by 2020 than uh, they did uh, in, the, in the past. Um, so in, in Middle East, uh, it's, uh, we have reduced our expectations uh, pretty much everywhere, um, and, uh, but it's still 2.6% uh, over the, on average over the period. So there's effects from the low price, effects from war, unrest, turmoil. Um, and again, the countries with, with uh, high buffers will be sh sheltered. Those with the low buffers will be the hardest hit. There's some drops in subsidies in, uh, in uh, the Middle East. Some countries are starting to, to, to cut subsidies or to implement other ways to reduce demand efficiency programs. So that's taking a little bit of a toll on, uh, on, on uh, demand. And China continues to, to shift gears. Uh, the economy rebalances, the economy slows down. It's moving to a, a less oil-intensive stage of development, more focus on consumer spending, less on uh, highly oil-intensive exports. Um, and, and a big shift to uh, environmental protection, cutting back on emissions, uh, cutting back on, uh, on, on energy intensity altogether. So we see diesel as, as less dominant, uh, less coal, uh, a, reduce, a reduction in coal demand translates into a reduction in, in diesel demand because so much diesel has been used in the past to, to uh, transport coal. Uh, a lot of the power generation is shifting closer to the coal mines, again, reducing the need for transport and for diesel. So, uh, and the natural gas is making significant inroads into the Chinese transport sector, uh, policy-driven again. So uh, we, we think that there's going to be a significant slowdown. The expectations that uh, China will continue to, to grow at the pace of the prior to the recession have been completely revisited. And that's been one of the, in our view, one of the big factors behind the price drop. Uh, the price drop was not entirely uh, supply driven. The, the surge in LTO production was perhaps the leading factor, but disappointing demand growth was an equally important factor and that had a lot to do with, with the rebalancing of China and the re reorientation of the Chinese economy towards a much less all-intensive uh, form of development. Uh, India is where we, we see more growth there, uh, again, uh, because of the growing confidence in the economy and, and uh, the fact that the subsidization is already pretty much uh, implemented. Uh, but generally speaking, I think that uh, there's been a complete reset of expectations of non-OECD demand growth. Uh, you know, if we look back at the period of the oil price rally of 2001 to 2008, the expectation, expectations were generally that non-OECD uh, economies were converging with OECD economies, and this would inevitably translate into spectacular demand growth. And we had seen spectacular demand growth in China in 2003, 2004, 
many analysts at the time extrapolated from those trends and uh, applied them to the future and to the rest of the non oecd countries. I think we've now completely revisited those, uh, those assumptions and it's becoming clear that the non oecd countries will follow their own path of energy development, will not replicate necessarily the path of OECD countries before them or even of China in the last decade. Uh, and, and this is partly because the, the, the fuel mix has evolved so, so, so drastically uh, in, the, in the last few years with so much growth in renewables, uh, cost reductions in, in, uh, in, in renewable energy, uh, increases in, uh, in technology, uh, improvements in technology, making it possible to, to transition out of oil. So we think it's a completely new stage of development there. Uh, not OECD Asia, we see some, uh, OECD Asia, we see contraction in, in Japan. So this is a uh, uh, continued switching out of oil, more gas, more nuclear in, in, uh, nucle in uh, Japan and Korea, uh, weak macroeconomic growth, uh, and, and, and strong efficiency improvements uh, across the, those countries. And Europe remains very weak. Uh, contraction of 0.7% uh, in our view per annum. Uh, the the uh, economy remains weak. The recovery remains very sluggish. Uh, deflation concerns are, are widespread. And there, too, we, we see efficiency gains uh, reining in consumption over the period. The U.S. is, is kind of a, an exception. Uh, there's a bit of a divergence in, within the OECD between the U.S. and the rest of the OECD. Uh, and there it's uh, supported uh, by uh, a more vibrant uh, economy um, and um, uh, with a little bit of a caveat, which is that the efficiency improvements in, in uh, transport are trimming gasoline and, and uh, jet demand growth. Uh, and perhaps some, some inroads of gas uh, in the transport sector as well. So this is a, a look at how the price changes have affected our forecast of uh, gasoline uh, demand growth for the U.S. Uh, the, the blue trend was our previous expectation uh, of a steep decline after a, a partial rebound in 2013-2014. Uh, we thought that there would be a efficiency improvements would really uh, create a, a reversal and a return to contraction. Now we still see contraction in U.S. gasoline demand, but much slower, a much, a much flatter outlook, and that's, in our view, an effect of the, of the lower price. We did a little bit of a look at uh, marine bunkers in our forecast because of the uh, steep changes uh, sweeping through this industry. Uh, for a long time, it had been uh, immune from the, the trends to, towards lower emissions, particularly sulfur, but now environmental regulation is, is catching up with the marine transport sector. Uh, this year, there's, uh, as of January 1st, uh, the uh, emission control areas have been expanded and uh, the, the uh, sulfur limits uh, is, uh, is lower there. Uh, but by 2020, or perhaps 2025, there's widespread sweeping uh, reductions in, in sulfur uh, targets, uh, which will affect the, the, uh, the market as a whole. And this creates all kinds of, uh, so this is the, the change in ECA um, as of January 15, but by 2020, uh, it's a cut from 3.5% sulfur uh, for uh, the rest of the world to 0.5%. So that's, that's potentially uh, a very disruptive or, or very uh, transform transformative shift in, uh, in uh, bunker demand. Um, bunker demand is a small share of the market, but it's not insignificant. It's the last, last large user of uh, residual fuel oil, and uh, that, uh, that support for residual fuel oil looks like it's about to, to disappear. So in order to deal with, with uh, the reduction in sulfur targets, really ship owners have three uh, major options. They can either uh, switch to diesel, or uh, put in scrubbers to remove the sulfur from their uh, emissions from resid, or they can switch to uh, LNG. And uh, uh, right now, nobody's moving. The refining industry is not really moving to upgrade its diesel uh, capacity, and ship owners have not really moved in a large way to install scrubbers or to, or to swift, sw switch to LNG. The, the LNG ship uh, order book is not uh, significantly larger, uh, but there's still a few years before 2020. Uh, here we've projected that most of the uh, adaptation effort would target diesel, that uh, most of the uh, ship owners would respond by shifting to diesel because it's the most, it seems to be the most cost effective, the, the cheapest way to respond uh, for, for existing ships. Um, and that would result in a displacement of demand of about 2 million barrels for, from uh, resid to, to diesel. So it's a very large, very large shift. Uh, it's, uh, 
it would be it would uh, cause marine diesel demand to increase uh, to 3.1 million barrels per day, and a resid demand to drop to 1 million. So it's a it's a major uh, rebalancing of the makeup of the demand barrel, uh, a major challenge for the refining industry. Uh, most likely, it's not going to play out exactly this way because the, this kind of uh, this, this shift is too uh, sudden and too too. Um, um, drastic to be easily accommodated, uh, but we, we are expecting some, uh, some um, turbulence in the market as a result of those changes. Just a few words on trade. We think crude trade has peaked uh, a couple of years ago. It's diminishing. It's diminishing mostly because more and more crude is being refined close to the wellhead. In North America, the refining industry is sourcing more and more of its crude regionally uh, with light title and, and uh, Canadian production. In the Middle East, uh, crude exporters are keeping more and more of their crude at home to refine for, uh, to meet domestic demand and also for export as, as products. So there's a, a significant drop in the total amount of crude being traded. Uh, I would add that it's not just the volume of crude being traded, it's also a change in the form of, of crude trade with less and less crude being, uh, trade being financed through the letter of credit system, more and more crude being bought on long-term contract uh, basis or as a on prepayment uh, through prepayments of uh, of exports with uh, large financing deals uh, mostly by China uh, with Russia with uh, Venezuela with other exporters so it's a it's a major shift in the way crude is being traded in the world both in terms of quality and quantity um, and uh, significantly a lot of this crude trade is moving east, uh, not surprisingly, and that's a trend that we've observed for a long time. Uh, there's nothing new there, but it's continuing, and it's continuing irrespective of price swings. The story hasn't changed dramatically. Uh, the, the light title surge in, in uh, North America has resulted uh, in a drop in, not just in a drop in, in North American imports of crude, but also in a drop in European uh, crude imports, uh, which is often lost in the discussion. Uh, because European refineries find it increasingly uh, difficult to compete with North American refineries, as well as new refineries elsewhere, like in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, or, or, or China. So we see uh, a sharp drop in European crude imports, a sharp drop in, in uh, North American crude imports, and a big increase in Asian crude imports. Crude producers now compete in the same market, uh, increasingly uh, in the Asian market, in Asian buyers, uh, are really uh, acquiring a lot more bargaining power, a lot more buying power, especially China. Uh, again, this is significantly affecting crude trade. Um, so, um, this is basically the same information presented differently. Uh, Chinese uh, export um, imports are, are, are growing dramatically and uh, in our view, that will uh, lead to an end to the Asian premium. I think it's already disappeared from the market. There's going to be more of that. Russian exports are, are shifting to, to Asia a lot. Uh, less less uh, crude is being exported west, more east. Uh, and now in the refining industry, uh, expansion plants have been scaled back since last year, uh, especially in China, uh, partly not so much driven by the price drop, but driven by low expectations of, of domestic demand growth. Uh, so many projects have been put on hold or, or postponed. There's a lot of projects that are coming online now. Those projects have been financed a long time ago. They have been planned maybe 10 years ago during the price rally and when uh, refining capacity was tight. Uh, so they, they are uh, coming online on stream. Uh, and we, we think that uh, by 2020, refining capacity will have increased by 6.4 million bars per day. Uh, and this will be led by non OCD Asia and, and the Middle East. This will uh, be a, a growth rate pretty much in line with the expected growth in demand, uh, almost barrel to barrel, but we think that the level of excess refining capacity will increase considerably because more and more of the demand is going to be met by products that will bypass the refining cycle altogether, uh, particularly natural gas liquids. Uh, coming out as a byproduct of, of U.S. Uh, shale production or also in the Middle East of Iranian production. And uh, at the same time, a uh, creep up in, in biofuels and gas and liquids and coal to liquids. So we, we, we see the level of excess refining capacity really increasing, putting pressure on refining margins, which had been strong last year, recovering from 
uh, capacity reductions over the last few years, but that, that uh, rebound, in our view, will be short-lived, and uh, margins will come under renewed pressure, and uh, this will uh, probably lead to more uh, shutdowns of capacity, in, uh, particularly in Europe, which looks particularly vulnerable, and perhaps some uh, postponements or cancellation of some projects that we have factored in in our forecast. Um, so non-OECD really account for 90% of this growth in capacity. The, the other 10% is basically the US. Um, and um, most of the non-OECD expansions are front-loaded. Again, it's uh, expansions that have been decided 10 years ago in a very different price and market environment, uh, much less at the back end of the curve uh, because of the postponement and scaling back of projects, of new projects, and some pressure on margins. So that's, uh, <coughs> I think that's, uh, in a nutshell, the main findings of our report. We, we have looked at, at uh, product supply. We run some uh, modeling exercises looking at where uh, supply will be coming from and where it will be needed. And uh, for naphtha and gasoline, we see excess production pretty much around the world, except in Asia, which will be uh, still uh, importing and importing more, despite the, all the growth in capacity there. And in Africa, we see continued uh, import dependence and growing import dependence for gasoline. But the Middle East, uh, the Americas, the FSU, Europe, all these countries will continue to be long gasoline, increasingly long gasoline, uh, due to the increase in light products uh, fed by uh, light uh, title in the US and upgrading in uh, refining capacity in, in the FSU. Uh, diesel is a different story, and partly because of the bunker changes, we see that potential tightness. Uh, potentially a major increase in, in diesel at the very back end of the curve if the IMO regulations come in force in, uh, in 2020. And that would create uh, a, a very sharp increase in European dependence on diesel imports, uh, which would uh, lead to uh, almost uh, 2 million barrels per day. Uh, so a dramatic uh, increase in, in European dependence. Uh, Africa remains short uh, diesel. Uh, South America remains short diesel. Asia remains short diesel. The big exporters would be uh, OECD Americas, the Middle East, and, and the FSU for the forecast period. Now, if we look beyond the forecast period, things change a bit as Middle East demand is expected to increase and absorb some of this excess production in the region. And fuel oil is a uh, is challenge, and uh, that market is shrinking with the changes in IMO regulations. There's some growth in power generation in the Middle East, but very limited. So that's the basic uh, findings of, of the report. Again, this is our best uh, exercise, best effort to try to understand comprehensively how the, the, the reset of price expectations will affect supply and, and demand balances and other aspects of the, of the supply chain. Now, many of these assumptions are untested by definition because the market is so different, so new. Uh, so many factors uh, are uh, unfolding for the first time. You know, light at all is a new development, so we've never seen that light at all respond to low prices. So we, we see how this plays out. Uh, and we, you know, we keep a close eye to the market, but this is uh, uh, our best uh, attempt to try to uh, map uh, how things might play out uh, with the, in view of the very dramatic uh, changes in circumstances of the last few months. Thanks. Thank you very much, Antoine. That was quite... Uh comprehensive and that brings a few things to my mind. One uh, is, a, I guess, an advertisement for CSIS that is on the refining side. There's so many changes that you uh, have teed up there. That we're, we're going to have a series on, on refinery issues here in the coming months, so that I think is quite uh, the, the need for that it was, came out evidently. The second one is a comment, and that is your last several points on the changing trade patterns, both geographically and the uh, less crude, more refined products, and uh, almost all growth in non-OEC, certainly has important implications for your colleagues at the IEA who do emergency planning and thinking about this. And I'm, as, as you were saying all this, I'm thinking, you know, maybe we should have uh, your counterpart who does that come and speak to us in the future, so we'll send that message back. So, But get to, to the questions before we open up. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I came away thinking, you know, sounds like what this five-year outlook is saying is OPEC probably did the right thing in November and in, in, in not trying to fight 
of this and, and by trying to manage the market and drop because you can see market share improving a bit. As you pointed out, the uh, supply elasticities now are stronger they, than they were in previous market downturns that we had in uh, particularly 86 and 98. So it is a different world, and, uh, and I, I don't know if you would, first of all, I don't, you don't have to be quoted as saying OPEC did the right thing. I know it's sensitive uh, as an IEA, but would you agree that this five-year outlook does seem to be somewhat positive for OPEC regaining market share, especially given the uh, uncertainties in Venezuela and Nigeria and, and Libya? Yeah, I, I think it's tempting to, to say that. At the same time, OPEC, in a way, is a bit of a, an abstraction these days because it's so different and it's so, so diverse. And undoubtedly for, I mean, we've seen the announcements uh, just a couple of days ago by the OPEC president for Nigeria uh, saying that there would be a, uh, maybe an emergency meeting before the next scheduled uh, meeting. So there's clearly pressures, tensions within some of the OPEC countries, the most directly adversely affected by, by the price drop, and those who have um, both uh, cash reserves, Venezuela, Nigeria, uh, look particularly vulnerable. Iran uh, looks uh, hard hit. <coughs> Algeria uh, has cash reserves, but uh, you know, the, the production outlook doesn't look too good, and uh, the pressures are, are mounting there as well. So it's, it's not a particularly rosy story across the board for all OPEC members. But if we look at uh, the, the aggregate of OPEC production, and especially if we look at the Gulf countries, uh, it looks like the decision to let the market rebalance is, is, is very sound and very rational. It's difficult to argue with it. Yeah. I probably should have substituted OPEC for Saudi Arabia or Saudi Arabia for OPEC, and maybe it would have been. When Adam was here yesterday, he uh, showed the latest EIA short-term outlook and what their uh, price uh, confidence interval the, using the Black-Scholes model that you're very familiar with in the uh, futures market, and that had a, a similar as, uh, assumption that prices would recover in the second half of uh, 016 by the latest, say, in the range you were 60, 70. Uh, but it did show a, a, on, in terms of confidence interval and what the market was uh, telling us from uh, for forward sales uh, of futures contracts that the downside risk was, it seemed to be larger than the upside risk, and he used the jaws that were $30 mm -hmm. on the low side and 100 on the high side, even though the reference case was $70. So where, w where would you, if, if you were advising clients in your former role as a financial uh, <laughs> Would you uh, think there's more downside risk than upside risk in, an, in this, this outlook? Price, price well, risk. You know, on, on fundamentals, assuming no disruption, on fundamentals, it looks like there's a lot of downside risk, at least for, for the next six months. In our projection, and obviously there's many moving parts in this and many things will change, but our balances suggest that stocks will continue to build in the next uh, six months. So I think the market, the price has recovered Partly because investors have been responding to the to the recount. You know, there's clearly a big response to the recount every week. Uh, the recount comes on Friday. You see the response on Monday. Um, but it's difficult to translate changes in the recount with changes in production. There's not a direct, uh, clear-cut relationship between the two because not all weeks are equal, and the, the ones retired most first are, are likely to be the least productive, and so on. Uh, but you know, other than the these the signals and the, these change of expectations that those signals have generated among some investors, uh, it looks like really the fundamental pressures continue to build for the next six months. And we think that the potential for stock deals uh, is very great and is likely to test storage capacity. We don't really know what global storage capacity is. It's not surveyed. It's not even surveyed in the OECD. Only the U.S. surveys capacity. Uh, we know what the last high in OECD storage was back in August 1999. And if we allocate the stock deals between the OECD and non-OECD, uh, it looks like we are on track to test, to, to revisit those highs, perhaps to, to, to exceed those highs uh, in the next six months or before July. Um, 
most likely storage capacity has significantly increased since 99. Uh, there's been increases in, in the US in response to, to the share revolution. There's been expansions of storage capacity or, or refurbishment of old multiple capacity or upgrades in uh, places like uh, the Caribbean or uh, increases in Fujera, increases in Singapore. So there's probably more storage capacity. But we've already seen the increase in floating storage. Uh, so that, that's a sign that capacity is being, is being tested. And, and regionally, uh, in some regions, it might be tested sooner than in others. So all that, in our view, leads to probably downward pressure on prices. Now, the risk of disruption is very high, of course. Uh, disruptions are no longer an attraction, no longer a footnote. Uh, we've had many of them in the last four years. Uh, we, we've seen all kinds of disruptions, but many politically driven uh, by events in the Middle East and North Africa. And undoubtedly, a very low price in countries where social spending uh, depends on a very high oil price. Uh, so the low price is, is, is not a recipe for social stability. Uh, again, it's, it's difficult to translate, uh, just like we count, but not necessarily translate into a sharp drop in production immediately. Social stability, instability might not immediately translate into supply reductions. Uh, we've seen Libya, uh, you know, being able to produce in the middle of a civil, in the midst of a civil war. We've seen uh, Iraq uh, increasing exports in the middle of uh, ISIS uh, assault and uh, price collapse. So we could see, you know, unrest in, in producer countries, and yet production still going on. But I think we have to uh, take into account the possibility of, of uh, adverse effect on supply from from social instability. Okay, that's, uh, we've got plenty of time for questions. Uh, gentleman in the back. Yeah, I was curious what the uh, current price drop and the slow uh, growth since 2020. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what the impact of the price drop and the slow recovery through 2020 might have on the uh, enhanced oil recovery as opposed to just uh, new, uh, new investment? I think it probably depends, uh, again, uh, country by country. In, in, in China, we think uh, enhanced oil recovery will allow the country to maintain production at pretty flat levels, but in other places, it's going to be too expensive and it's going to be, uh, it's going to have an adverse effect on supply. A big, a big component, a big, uh, a big piece of uh, our forecast, which maybe doesn't come across strongly enough, is uh, not just postponements of projects, but uh, uh, the, the effect of maintenance, uh, because for producers, a way to cut uh, costs is not just to defer projects, but also to squeeze the most out of existing producing fields. And there's going to be an incentive to postpone maintenance, to, to squeeze the most out, uh, to, to, to maximize production rates. And that will be at the, at the cost of higher depletion rates uh, <coughs> later on at the back end of the forecast and beyond that. So over the forecast period, we see a, a, an increase in depletion rates, of the, in, decline, in decline rates from about Three to five percent uh, currently to about seven percent by the, by 2020, and uh, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a hit on the enhanced oil recovery, and that's going to be part of that picture. Well, I forgot to mention that. Please identify your yourself and your aff affiliation, and Sarah's going to demonstrate that now. Thanks very much, Antoine. My name is Sarah Ladisla. I work here in the Energy and National Security Program at CSIS. Um, thanks. The wonderful presentation, as always. A couple things. You mentioned a few times um, and, and just sort of brought up again the idea of reforms, um, especially to subsidies and sort of you know places where they're either highly revenue dependent or in places where it's become more important for them to attract capital investment to be able to increase production. Can you talk a little bit about, because we don't hear a lot about that uh, these days, um, can you talk a little bit about where you think those reforms are potentially um, uh, significant as opposed to things that get announced uh, and, and not really carried out? I mean, this is not your first outlook, right? So we've gone through periods before where this stuff gets announced, and as long as the price recovers in a reasonable amount of time, it really doesn't take hold. The reason why I'm interested in it is we, we had a conference here uh, not too long ago on, on the oil market situation, and, and um, Jim Burkhart from IHS was really talking about the next five to 10 years as a period where we understand a bit more about the sort of oil peak demand theory and how fast or quickly that peak might be coming. And I think some of these you know, non-OECD subsidy reform efforts could be really important to understanding, you know, creating new markets for oil if, if that's going to happen at all. So I just wanted to know if you had more to say on that. 
Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's a big question, and uh, we, we actually follow this issue uh, at the AE, not just in my division, but uh, in part of the uh, uh, Global Energy Economics Division, we, we have a special uh, focus on, on, on subsidy reform and uh, as part of our policy uh, advocacy uh, component. Uh, I think the short answer is uh, subsidy reform is becoming popular, it's becoming a buzzword pretty much everywhere, including, surprisingly, I even in the Middle East. Uh, but we're not <laughs> expecting to see dramatic changes in the Middle East because of the uh, social stability concerns and the potential for desubsidization to really get people uh, upset and, uh, and angry. Uh, so where we see most of the, uh, um, uh, those efforts really having teeth uh, is, uh, is Southeast Asia uh, and South Asia. So countries where the import bill was uh, in the, in the run-up in prices had been uh, excessively uh, uh, burdensome for the government uh, where uh, subsidies have been very uh, costly but very ineffective as well. Uh, so there, the, the, I think the, the momentum for reform was already uh, there before the price collapse uh, because of the, 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 the impact of the uh, financial burden that the, those subsidies represented for the government. Uh, and now they're, they're being facilitated by the, by the price drop, which makes it easier for, for the government to... Uh, to remove subsidies because it doesn't necessarily translate into a big change in the actual price that consumers face. Uh, the, the subsidy reform is one component. Another component is the, the switch, the, the increase in the biofuel mandate, pretty much in the same country. It is typically the same map. The map of countries increasing the biofuel mandate and those ca getting subsidies tend to be the same for the same reasons. So that's, uh, we, we think that's really starting to, to, to take effect and to have a, an impact. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Eugene Tan from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm wondering about volatility in oil prices. Um, so financial analysts, some of them say that oil will settle at $60 per barrel, between $70 per barrel, or might go down in the short term to as low as $20. How do short-term volatility, uh, how does short-term volatility affect your outlook in supply and demand? How does it affect the oil outlook for the longer term, I mean? Oh. I guess for the short term. And short term and longer term, right. both sides. Well, <coughs> you know, there's, there's, uh, there's been talk about uh, prices dropping to 20, uh, and we don't forecast, we don't actually have price targets, so we, we limit ourselves to price direction. So I would agree that there's room for downward movements on prices uh, initially, that the, the rebound was a bit of a head fake. Um, I wouldn't commit myself to, to a target, but I don't think anybody in the industry would think that 20, uh, if we got there, would be a sustainable price. So it's not so much about whether the price will drop uh, for a short period of time, it's about longer term price expectations. And I don't think those have been you know, downgraded to, to, to that extent. So in, in, we, you know, we might see some swings in prices before, before the recovery really uh, um, gains momentum and becomes uh, more sustained. But the, the, um, the, the investment decisions are not going to be based on, in my view, on a, on a $20 price expectation. It's going to be based on something higher. And we'll get some, I guess, one early sense of that when EIA comes out with its annual energy outlook in April. You know, they now will have t had time to kind of think about the implications of this recent drop and what it means for the long, longer term. So, and then after that, the IEA comes out with the WIO in probably, what, November. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how the uh, institutions like IEA and EIA and some of the companies do, uh, do now rethink maybe the long term, given what's happened, yeah. Because of course the price drop is, is just one side of the coin, right? The other side is the, the drop in costs. Um, which is just as steep, and also cyclical. I mean, uh, there's been a very sharp reduction in, in costs and fees charged by service companies and so on, but I don't think we should uh, expect those, those uh, drops to be sustained either. Okay. They're, they're cyclical as well, and they're going to be rebounding once demand for those services rebounds. But it's clear that some cancellations, uh, in our view of projects, 
uh, announced by companies, uh, for instance, in West Africa, uh, probably should not be taken at, at face value. Uh, it's probably part of an effort to renegotiate contracts, to re renegotiate terms. Uh, just because a company you know, tells uh, uh, service providers that project is off the table, you know, go back, go back uh, uh, to your headquarters, uh, we can't take the contract, doesn't mean necessarily it's off the book. It's, I think those projects, we, we stay on the book, but we come back on much more favorable terms for the companies. Yes, Frank. Uh, Frank Perastro, also CSIS. Antoine, thank you very much. Um, you alluded to the fact that, so with new crude producers, right, and demand going down, that, that crude trade is shifting. It's becoming more intra-regional, and that the, the crude routes and the volumes are shifting. As you start looking at refined product with new refinery investments, a rationalization of old refineries, you're also gonna start seeing product demand and trade shift as well, right? Mm -hmm. So for Europe, when you start looking at things like energy to security, do you get concern where inefficient refineries disappear and then they're reliant on a uh, product from the Middle East or product from Asia, mm -hmm. and whether that enhances or, or impedes energy security? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the flip side of the diminishing crude trade is the expansion of the product trade. So the, just as the crude, crude uh, map shrinks and, and moves east, the product trade expands and, and becomes much more global, and the products become much more global. And uh, as you note, uh, in Europe, the dependency on import is increasing sharply. And uh, European demand has, has dropped very dramatically over the last 10 years, uh, but European refined product output has dropped even faster. Uh, and uh, both with shutdowns of refineries and low utilization rates at existing or remaining refineries. So imports have been increasing, surprisingly. Uh, and, and I think it can be seen both ways. Uh, in a way, the globalization of the market means that there's more arbitrage opportunities, more options for products to find, to find markets, more perhaps flexibility in the system. Uh, any market can depend on a much greater uh, number of sources uh, of products now. Uh, and we see you know, Indian exports go in all directions, uh, uh, and uh, exports from any major refining hubs going in all directions, depending on market opportunities. At the same time, depending on longer haul supply means uh, a higher risk of disruption, and means that a, a disruption would take longer to be addressed, and would be more difficult to address. Uh, we see it even here in the US when there's a disruption in refining output in California, uh, it takes time for the market to respond because it's always unclear how long the disruption will last, uh, whether it will still be uh, 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 there when the, 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 supply, the, the products get to the market. So it raises all kinds of issues. I think the, the short answer is it creates a need for much higher stocks uh, as a buffer for disruption risks. And this is not something that's been as yet uh, comprehensively addressed by European governments or uh, by Europe as a, as a, as a whole, uh, certainly something which will be on the agenda. Uh, and, and right, right. And, and the nature of the product and the crude trade changes also with increasingly more and more intermediate products, uh, blending components or, or feedstock, not crude, but intermediate feedstocks, which complicates uh, the, the understanding and analysis of the market. Uh, we'll start with you uh, in front, front here. While you're bringing the mic, the other point about when you brought up California is also the stricter environmental standards make it difficult to have the right products come from outside. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation, Antoine. I'm Courtney Vaughan with Gulf Lady, and we're energy consultants. A firm we do business mostly in West Africa. With the changes in prices downward, demand changes source of, you know, the energy change in the, the mix, et cetera. What do you see happening with the infrastructure that carries it, especially the various energy sources, oil, gas, right? West Africa, U.S., et cetera. In terms of the, um, the debt institutions that would provide debt financing, you know, into this mix, it seems like there is probably a mixed match if you are retiring certain sort of... Um, say, oil facility, if you're, you're getting less out of it by way of supply, 
And you know, when one look at our debt is structured, et cetera, I, I feel that probably you could shed some light on what you see happening with those institutions. So the, the relationship between debt and infrastructure? Or? Yeah, there is a relationship. Many countries right. borrow abroad, and you know, if you're retiring before debt is retired, et cetera, in terms of your um, capability to sell, right? given market forces, I would imagine that some countries could go back into serious debt situation with some of the international institutions. What do you hear or see? I, I don't know. I, I see several questions in, in what you're saying. I'm not sure how to relate them together, but uh, th that issue is certainly uh, something we have to pay attention to, uh, both sovereign debt and, and corporate debt. Mm -hmm. Corporate debt, particularly for large agro companies that are highly leveraged and uh, are now facing less uh, revenues. So we, we, this is something we need to uh, incorporate it into our analysis uh, to a much greater degree than we have in the past. Uh, in, in the past, we could ignore, you know, to a large degree, the financial health of companies. This was something that was on the radar screen, but not center. Uh, now it's much more central. And we have, I think, to make an adjustment to an, uh, our analysis to really pay a lot more attention to, to debt. Uh, that said, uh, you know, if individual companies, a company uh, goes bankrupt, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that its assets would not produce or that its projects would not be taken up by somebody else. Uh, in fact, we might see uh, you know, uh, some degree of restructuring in the industry with some companies you know, uh, um, becoming uh, um, insolvent and uh, going down, but we might see an improvement in efficiency as new companies, new, new, uh, new actors uh, purchase those assets and, and run them more efficiently or not, uh, there's uh, many question marks around this, but certainly a valid question. Uh, sovereign debt is also an issue in the case of Venezuela, you know, what would happen if Venezuela had defaulted on, on, on debt or if Russia did and so on and so forth. Uh, infrastructure developments, uh, some of them, you know, especially midstream pipelines, uh, terminals, there's certainly a readjustment there and we haven't looked at it in as much depth as perhaps we should, but just because of resource constraints, but clearly, uh, some pipeline projects will be delayed because they might be more difficult to finance in a, in a lower price environment uh, and, uh, and perhaps in a lower demand environment. And uh, some, some storage, uh, in the storage industry, we've seen some movement recently, we've seen like uh, many um, uh, assets uh, offered for sale, uh, for instance, mm -hmm. in the Amsterdam, Antwerp, uh, Rotterdam area. Uh, so, but again, in terms of what this means for supply and demand in the long run, uh, it might be just noise at the surface. It might not really necessarily affect the longer term forecast. Thank you. Thank you. Time for one more. Uh, Howard Grunspeck in the back. Are you going to beg Antoine to come back to EIA? He's coming back to EIA right after this. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> we're going over there together. In five minutes. Right? No, seriously. I, I know what he meant. <laughs> I never beg. Antoine's always welcome at EIA. But the, uh, uh, and the tougher questions we'll ask when you come over to EIA, because we're polite people. But, the, uh, but implicit in your, in your presentation, I think, is that you know, US product demand, although you've revised it upward, is still going down. And, and you have a projection of pretty significant growth in U US crude oil production. And uh, I think you also said, very EIA-like, uh, unlike your longer-term products, that uh, your medium-term outlook reflects current laws and policies. Uh, so my question is, is, is it implicit in what you've presented that there's like a, a huge increase in U.S. net product exports? There's, there's an increase, perhaps not huge. Uh, we do, so the, 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 for the U.S., the assumption is a bit more nuanced, maybe, because we do assume policy as usual, uh, existing policies, but in the case of the U.S., I think we do um, uh, factor in a trend towards a more flexible implementation of okay. existing policies. Uh, another example of American exceptionalism. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So we, we, do, we do have a modest increase in, in condensate exports uh, in the U.S. We, we don't, we're not assuming an overhaul of the uh, export ban, but we, we assume that the, within the existing legislation, there's going to be room for a little bit more condensate exports. Well, thank you very much, Antoine. Please join me in uh, thanking Antoine. <laughs> <laughs>